Hello and welcome. I'm Jesse Stolark. I'm the Public Policy and Member Relations Manager for the Carbon Capture Coalition, a collaboration of more than 80 businesses and organizations building federal policy support to enable economy-wide commercial scale deployment of carbon management technologies. What do I mean when I say carbon management? Well, I'm referring to carbon capture, removal, transport, utilization, and storage from industrial facilities, power plants, and ambient air. This afternoon, we have a great discussion lined up with some of the leaders in the carbon utilization space. Um, but before we get started, I just had a couple of housekeeping items. First is that we ask you to stay on mute during the event. During Q&A, if you have a question, you can raise your hand via the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you or you may type your question into the Q&A box. And I also want to thank the co-hosts of today's event, Lanza Tech and Carbon 180 for all of their efforts in helping us to pull together this great event. So let's jump, jump right in. So what is carbon utilization? Simply put, it's turning carbon into stuff that we use every day. Carbon utilization may sound like science fiction, but it's increasingly a reality and is necessary to meet net zero emissions targets and mid-century climate goals. To grow this carbon to value sector, we will need a host of supportive policy, which we will have a chance to learn more and discuss more on this afternoon. But before we just dive into our discussion and questions, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Jennifer Holgram, the CEO of Lanza Tech, who will provide framing remarks for our discussion this afternoon. Lanza Tech is working towards deploying carbon capture and reuse facilities globally to make fuels and chemicals from waste carbon. In addition to her leadership of Lanza Tech, Jennifer is the director and chair of the Lanza Jet Board of Directors, a new company that will produce sustainable aviation fuel. Jennifer and Lanza Tech are now on the cutting edge of realizing a new carbon economy. Throughout her career, Jennifer has played a pivotal role in the development of alternative aviation fuel, including as VP and general manager of the Renewable Energy and Chemicals Business Unit at UOP LLC, a Honeywell company. Under her management, UOP technology became instrumental in producing nearly all of the initial fuels used by commercial airlines and the military for testing and certification of alternative aviation fuel. I was also told I would be remiss if I didn't mention that she is a tremendous dog lover and a committed Greyhound rescuer. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand things over to Jennifer. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction, Jesse, and it's a real pleasure to be with all of you. I'm gonna just run through um, how we think about this sector and, and what we're trying to create, which is really the ability to convert waste carbon to the things that we need and use every day. I, I was born in Colombia, and the first time that I really realized, or at least that, that climate change hit me directly was when I realized that uh, Colombia would not be a coffee growing, growing country by the year 2050. It taught me that climate change was a fundamental change to our ecosystem and that it would happen in our lifetimes. These were forecasts for 2050 and I certainly intend to be around. Just less than 10 years later from when I started talking about the impact of climate change beyond sea level rise, this is the world that surrounds us. And as we talk about what is gonna happen by the end of the century, four degrees, three degrees, two degrees, you have to realize that every single carbon atom that goes into the atmosphere is more people suffering, more people dying. And we just absolutely have to bend this carbon curve. We have to take the assumption that all carbon is precious, not just the carbon and diamonds, and we have to lock it all away. It's a pretty easy thing to say. It's a very difficult thing to do because the reality is that more than 30% of today's fossil use doesn't go to making power, doesn't go to making fuels, but goes to making all of the other things that we use in our daily lives. So this is not a trivial ask. So if I think about where we can reserve carbon or conserve our carbon budget, I think it becomes pretty clear that Already today, energy can be carbon free, whereas chemicals are carbon backbones and we're gonna need carbon budget for all of that. And we believe at Lancet Tech and I think at, at this coalition that where the carbon that you use to make all of the things we need comes from will define our climate future. Today we use 100 million barrels, 4 billion gallons 
a day of petroleum equivalent. The only way we can match that demand is really if we start to think about carbon coming from waste resources. There's already a plenty of carbon above the ground, carbon that is either out of flu stack or trapped in a solid waste, or the carbon that's causing us problems, the CO2 that's around us. We believe that that's enough carbon to make everything we need. And that's exactly what Lancet has been use, doing. It's been using, what Lancet does is it ferments waste carbon emissions. We have a bacterial process that takes carbon emissions and converts those to the products we use every day. Those could be industrial emissions, like at a steel mill or a refinery, gasified solids, like municipal solid waste, or um, if we could use, we can use CO2, either by converting it with our partners 12 to CO through their technology, or by adding green hydrogen. So both of, both of those approaches that use electrolysis, if we can bring green electrons, we're able to convert that to a feedstock that we can use. And at the end of the day, then what we're doing is we're making all of the things we use in our daily lives from aviation fuel to polyester. I think it's really important to take one moment to talk about CO2 and direct conversion of CO2. I believe this is extremely important because if we are to continue to talk about aviation, we need to then take that CO2 and convert it to products. And we have partners like Carbon Engineering on the direct air car capture side that take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. All of this is a whole that basically says everything that's already above ground can be reused. Now, I know you're sitting and going, well, Jennifer, that's not all nice, but it's all science fiction and we can't get there from here. So let's talk about something much more practical. And what I would offer up is this picture, which is our commercial plant in China that uses our technology and takes away steel mill gas and has been converting those carbon oxides to ethanol since 2018. We've made more than 25 million gallons to date using this novel gas fermentation technology. Obviously, and I think it's an important point and it's relevant to the discussion today, you don't get there in five minutes. You get there in over 15 years of scale up. And we've taken the technology and scaled it starting up in 20, 2005 when the company was founded. And, it's really important to remember that it takes a long time to put steel in the ground and more importantly, to scale a new technology. We are building commercial plants in other parts of the world using the same feedstocks I mentioned, whether they be waste industrial gases or gasified solids. Let me show you uh, what we're doing. Uh, ethanol, making all that ethanol is not an end of itself. We're trying to convert ethanol to other products because we know as we transition to electric vehicles, using ethanol to blend with gasoline isn't exactly the future of waste resources, but we believe ethanol is a feedstock and can be converted to all other products. All ethanol is, is a way to aggregate all these wastes, all the carbon and energy in these waste resources into something that can be moved. So taking ethanol to jet fuel, this is after we landed a first commercial flight using uh, recycled carbon emissions from a steel mill. We converted that ethanol to jet fuel and flew a flight from Orlando to Gatwick with Virgin Atlantic. We are building a commercial facility that will produce 10 million gallons of sustainable aviation fuel uh, starting up at the end of next year in Georgia near Savannah. We have taken that ethanol that we make in China that's fuel grade, cleaned it up, and it's now being sold in Switzerland in, in cleaners. Um, we will also be, um, Cody will also be transitioning their ethanol and their perfumes to our ethanol from recycled carbon. Unilever has introduced a detergent made with surfactant that was produced from our ethanol. And um, Lululemon has made this fabric from polyester that we've made at commercial scale from our ethanol. And L'Oreal has made with Total 
pilot scale bottles of polyethylene that they have used shampoo, have put shampoo and conditioner. So as you can see, based on that one commercial plant making ethanol, we've been able now to produce um, samples as well as commercial quantities of materials. The world that we're trying to create is shown here a world where a consumer can ask themselves where the carbon in their product comes from. Just like fair trade coffee, you have a choice at your store. We believe that consumer will someday have a choice to buy a pair of shoes or a perfume that was made with recycled carbon rather than fresh fossil carbon. So um, just to conclude, I, I just wanna say we really need to rethink carbon. We need to rethink where the carbon in all of our products comes from. We need to rethink refining. Refining cannot be about the conversion of fossil resources. Refining can be about converting waste carbon, including refining CO2. This is all possible if we can leverage clean power and biology, which is what I've shown you today and hopefully shown you that we can make everything we need in this way. I'm asking you to consider that we need to change the entire process industry and make everything from waste. And for all of you in policy, this is carbon reuse. This is carbon capture and utilization. And it's a new industry that will make the existing model of making everything we need obsolete. And we need your help to be able to get this nascent industry off the ground. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Jennifer, thank you so much for that incredible opening to, to today's discussion. Um, I know we'll hear a little bit more from you later, but it's been great to hear about all the exciting things happening at Lanza Tech. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Madeline Morrison. Um, let me share my screen really quickly. Can everyone see that? Great, no. thanks, Erin. Um, my name's, like I said, my name's Madeline Morrison. I'm the External Affairs Manager for the Carbon Capture Coalition. Um, really appreciate you all joining in on today's event. Um, I know it's been a very busy few weeks and months for everyone. Um, but before we jump into that great panel of folks that we have lined up later in the session, um, just wanted to give you all a quick overview of the coalition um, and where our priorities currently stand in Congress. So the Carbon Capture Coalition, as Jesse said earlier, is a nonpartisan collaboration of more than 80 businesses and organizations, including our two esteemed co-hosts today, Lanza Tech and Carbon 180. Um, and we work with our coalition to build federal policy support for economy-wide deployment of carbon capture, utilization, removal, transport, and storage. Our mission is to reduce carbon, carbon emissions to meet mid-century climate goals, foster domestic energy and industrial production, and support a high-wage job space through the adoption of carbon capture technologies. Our membership spans a pretty wide array of organizations, including energy, industry, and technology companies, energy and industrial labor unions, and conservation and environmental and, and energy policy organizations. And as you can see by our list of, our, of participating and observing members, we really do span the gambit of energy sector organizations and political affiliations, which really makes our, cons our consensus-based approach all the more unique in Washington. And to that point, we are also a deeply bipartisan coalition, a stipulation that works in our favor, as we're already seeing that the best chance we have to pass meaningful energy and climate legislation is really in those areas where there is broad bipartisan support and agreement. Um, and right now that includes carbon capture policy. Which brings me to policies that carbon management supporters are advocating for at a, at a federal level. Um, in August, a group of 170 plus stakeholders sent a letter to congressional leadership calling for the inclusion of six bipartisan carbon management policy priorities in any moving legislative vehicle. As we now know, the Senate passed an infrastructure package that really represented a coalescing from both sides of the aisle um, around scaling carbon management technologies at the rate necessary to put us squarely on track to meet mid-century climate goals. The legislation included two of these significant priorities, like the Storing CO2 and Lowering Emissions Act to help finance the build out of regional CO2 transport and storage hubs, 
and also funding for critical 2020 Energy Act authorizations to support commercial skill demonstrations and feed studies for carbon capture. The inclusion of these priorities was a huge step forward for carbon management as a whole. But as, infrastructure, as the infrastructure bill did not include revenue-based provisions, we are targeting inclusion for these types of priorities in the next legislative vehicle. It's also important to mention that each of these following priorities have been included and strongly supported bipartisan legislation, which is demonstrated in the chart you see here, and in, in elements of the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan, fiscal year 2022 budget request, and tax reform proposal. The first of these is a direct pay mechanism for the federal section 45Q tax credit. This is really the most critical reform to unlock investment in carbon capture projects. Direct pay creates an urgently needed alternative for the majority of project developers who otherwise lack sufficient taxable income to utilize the credit or are exempt from federal tax liability. Next, we have a, a multi-year extension of the 45Q commenced construction window. A significant extension is necessary to provide the long-term certainty for private investment and commercial deployment. More complex and capital intensive carbon capture projects can have lead times of several years before complete beginning construction, meaning that some of the potential projects that are starting today are already risking missing the newly extended deadline at the end of 2025, which is really can be detrimental to a project's viability. Then we have increased credit values for higher cost technologies. As currently designed, very little carbon capture deployment will occur in certain sectors due to the greater cost of capturing carbon and commercial risk. Bills providing differentiated credit values for industrial facilities, power plants, and direct air capture facilities will help to incentivize private investment in these sectors and deploy these technologies at a faster rate. Finally, we have the elimination of annual capture thresholds. Since the reform and expansion of 45Q, it's become very clear that current eligibility thresholds, based, which are based on annual capture or utilization rates, stifle innovation and severely limit the number of facilities and, in, and industries able to participate. This in turn reduces the overall emissions reduction potential, potential of the 45Q program. All in all, this is really just an arbitrary rule that serves no real policy purpose. Together with the priorities already included in the bipartisan infrastructure package, we see these provisions as a must pass portfolio of complementary carbon management policies that are required for any broader strategy in achieving net zero emissions by mid century, protecting and creating high wage jobs and supporting regional economies across the nation. So while budget reconciliation is at the front of most discussions in Congress at the moment, we too are eyeing it as the next possible legislative vehicle to see our remaining policy priorities rolled into. In that same vein, ahead of this week's markup, last Friday, the House Ways and Means Committee released the base text for their portion of the reconciliation package. In terms of carbon management priorities, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, first, we were very grateful to see the bill, that the bill included two of the top priorities I mentioned previously. First, a multi-year extension of the 45Q tax credit, which extends the commence construction window through 2031. And it also included a direct pay option at the full value of 45Q for any project beginning construction before January 1st, 2032. These are really critical provisions to scaling up carbon capture at a rate necessary to meet mid-century climate goals, and we're excited to see them represented so clearly in the Ways and Means text. But while the draft text makes those significant contributions toward economy-wide deployment of carbon capture technologies, it also included some provisions which stifle innovation and widespread deployment. Most notably, the bill takes steps to significantly lower the annual capture eligibility thresholds in the 45Q program, but it in turn pairs these lower thresholds with harmful new percentage capture requirements applied at the level of the whole facility. This provision blocks deployment of carbon capture technologies at, at the hardest to abate sectors, both industrial and power generation facilities and runs fundamentally, fundamentally counter, counter to how project, projects are developed. And while the bill includes increased 45Q credit values for direct air capture technologies, it does not do so for carbon capture projects in industry and power generation, where higher credit values are essential for wide-scale deployment. In addition to the Ways and Means releasing their draft text, the Senate Finance Committee is working to pull their portion of the reconciliation package together. 
The committee has confirmed that the Clean Energy for America Act, which was marked up earlier this year in committee, will serve as the base text. That bill includes priorities like direct pay, increased credit values for direct air capture projects, and an extension to the commenced construction window. And while it doesn't currently include stepped up credit values for industrial and power generation projects, conversations with committee staff indicate that higher credit values for industrial sectors could also be on the table. So while things are constantly ebbing and flowing in reconciliation worlds, we are continuing to advocate for elements like increased credit values for industry as a whole, including industrial applications and power generation, along with the elimination of arbitrary annual thresholds. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jesse Stolark to moderate our panel. Jesse? Thanks, Madeline. That, <laughs> thanks for that whirlwind, whirlwind tour through current um, policy. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, can you, hey, Malin, do you want to stop? There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, the joys of, of virtual events. So let's switch now to our panel discussion. Um, we're going to ha have Atasha Cave, the co-founder of CSO and CSO of 12, Aaron Burns, the executive director of Carbon 180. And then we heard from her earlier, but for those of you who joined our session a little, a few minutes late, uh, we will also have Jennifer Holmgren, CEO of Lance Attack. So first I wanna to turn to Atasha. Um, Atasha, Madeline discussed earlier that the CATCH Act would eliminate thresholds for capture of carbon dioxide and its precursor carbon monoxide from industry power and directly from the air. Can you talk a little more about what the elimination of thresholds um, in the 45Q tax credit would practically mean for your technology and other utilization startups? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first is, you know, for those who um, aren't familiar with 12, uh, we are a, a carbon transformation and utilization company. We develop electrochemical reactors that take electricity um, and input CO2 and water and bring that CO2 and water in the presence of a metal catalyst that breaks down that CO2 and water molecule and reforms those um, atomic bits into new molecules. And we can make things like jet fuel and polymers and other things out of CO2. And we just focus on the transformation part um, and the utilization. And um, you know, we're, we're start smart up, we're, we're growing. And so um, for us, that minimum threshold meant um, that the 45Q law was something that certainly was great about bringing people to the table and bringing investors interested in it. But realistically, for our first set of projects, uh, it would be uh, the threshold would be way too high for us to be able to directly use the 45Q uh, law. And then with the the um, initial time um, timeline, it was you know it it just increased the risk of any kind of um, bigger projects that we were working with customers where they might. Be like, mm, you know, is this going to come in under the threshold or come in above the threshold and then also uh, meet, the, meet the timeline requirement? So I'm super excited that uh, both the threshold has been, uh, you know, uh, changed and then eliminated. And then also that um, the timeline has been extended. That's really exciting for us. And are you, you know, trying to put a finer point on it is 12 kind of alone in the utilization space with the the not being able to access the 45 q tax credits because of the threshold no absolutely not. you know i mean carbon tech in general um has many new startups and new players on the scene and um and in fact beyond um you know enhanced oil recovery um most of the other carbon tech utilization technologies that I'm aware of are all kind of starting out within the past, you know, five or so years. Uh, so it's a very early nascent field. And so, you know, you have to like, reduce the technology risk and the market risk by starting small, by doing pilots, working your way up, doing larger scale demonstration, and then doing the full scale deployment. And um, every startup in this space has that same lineage um, just because of, of you, you de-risk the technology as you go along and de-risk the company as you go along. Great, thank you. That's, that's really helpful to hear more about. I'm gonna to turn to Aaron next. So Aaron, um, your organization, Carbon 180, your mission is to fundamentally rethink carbon. And I was hoping you could unpack that statement a little bit for us um, and discuss why 
you know, you guys are focusing on carbon and the in the broader climate and net zero um, discussion. Yeah, uh, and thanks, uh, Jesse, for that question. So um, I'm Erin Burns. I'm the executive director of Carbon 180. As Jesse mentioned, we are a climate NGO focused entirely on carbon removal. So we work on everything from land-based solutions to tech-based solutions and work with companies like Lands Attack and 12. Uh, and we really work on this because we need carbon removal to meet climate goals. Um, in addition to really, really aggressive mitigation. And in particular, we need carbon removal and to address legacy emissions. We have too much carbon in the atmosphere right now. People around the world are already experiencing severe impacts of climate change. And we really need to scale carbon removal to the billion ton level to stop those impacts. Um, and we think carbon tech can play a really important role in scaling carbon removal and helping decarbonization more broadly. So Jennifer, uh, I always love hearing Jennifer talk about this. Like, I feel like the, the story she tells is so compelling. Lands Attack has done so much, I mean, you know, to the point that it, it sounds like science fiction and that it is very cool and very future oriented, but it's something that they are doing um, and have been doing for a while. So, um, you know, Jennifer talked about how utilization can help create low and zero carbon alternatives to products that most of us use every single day. And we did a market sizing report. My colleague, uh, Rory Jacobson, our deputy director of policy back in 2018, co-authored a report looking at the total available market for these carbon tech goods and found the new, in the US alone, it's about a trillion dollars. So there's also a really big economic opportunity here. Um, and this is about you know speeding decarbonization in places like aviation and building materials, but can also be about an economic opportunity to create new zero carbon industries. So thinking about as we move away from fossil fuel production in the US, I come from Southern West Virginia, um, and you know thinking about what the future of those places is gonna look like or industrial hubs in the US. And so I think it's something that has got all of these big opportunities in it and something that we find is, um, you know, I think in particular, when we think about the kinds of federal policies that are needed to address climate change, this really big opportunity to decarbonize, you know, hard to decarbonize things and building materials, aviation, fuels, et cetera, uh, create jobs and new sorts of really durable long-term climate forward industries. And finally, I think for us too, thinking about the need for carbon removal and climate um, and addressing climate change, that utilization uh, it creates this market for the captured CO2. And when we think about things like direct air capture, you know, we don't have a price on carbon. Um, we have policies like 45Q and investments in R&D to help scale direct air capture, but you're capturing that CO2. And while, you know, we need to store lots and lots of it, in the near term in particular, you have this opportunity to use it, to sell it, um, so that it can be used in these products that are also going to further decarbonization goals. And so um, uh, for us, it's sort of all connected. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, finally, I want to turn to Jennifer. So, Jennifer, you know, we talked a little bit with Natasha about the thresholds in the existing 45Q statute um, in terms of what you have to capture for at different facilities. Um, but could you talk a little bit about why the current value provided to utilization products under 45Q, which, as a reminder for our audience, is $35 a ton, is insufficient to really see project deployment here in the US? That's a great question. So to be fair, I will actually say it, it is helpful. So it, it, we need more, but, but let's at least set that as a frame of reference. But what, what I would say is there's two issues here. One is these are all new technologies. And so there's a risk factor in getting them built and scaled, right? So the first constructions always cost more and just financing them costs more. And so what that means is that we need a higher incentive. And frankly, if I look at the incentive that carbon sequestration gets relative to carbon use to make products, they are different and carbon sequestration gets a higher number. I get the argument that carbon sequestration locks it back down in the ground permanently, and that's a huge reason to incentivize that. But that is already a developed industry. This has been known, the use of carbon sequestration and the use of UR. The utilization is a much more nascent industry, as Atasha said. And so 
really what we need to do is at least get those two incentives at parity so that we can incentivize the new industry. That's really what we have to do is, is get um, utilization understood as a path, a disruptive path to changing how we make everything and um, put it in the portfolio at a much higher level. Uh, Jesse, can I respond to that? Okay. Absolutely, please. Uh, I love this point because I think back to the updates in 2018 where um, the updates of 45Q and the Future Act where at the time getting director capture in there or utilization outside of enhanced oil recovery was such a big win and we were so excited just to get them in there. And I think since then we've been able to, this conversation has correctly evolved to say, you know, actually, for example, direct air capture and point source carbon capture are different points in technology development. Point source carbon capture has been around even at a arguably, you know, not, not the scale we want to see, but in commercial facilities and technology for decades. And there are different costs, you know, relative technology costs and on all of those points. And I think the same conversation around utilization could be really, really important where getting it tacked on to say you have two different values. You have a value for any kind of use, use, everything from enhanced oil recovery to things that, you know, are hopefully being invented in a lab somewhere right now to, you know, and then you have a cost for that geologic storage. And I totally agree with Jennifer that, you know, geologic storage is super duper important. And you, you know, you have to think about increased value for that in some ways, because you're not going to, you know, nobody's paying for it right now. Um, and, but I think talking about decoupling things where enhanced oil recovery, which in addition to, you know, people have different views on this and different questions. I'll say we're coming out with a position paper on this, but, you know, is something that has been around for a much longer time and isn't, you know, doesn't have those same challenges that Jennifer was talking about around new technology development, the first of a kind, the first few of a kind. And so thinking about a higher value for, for uh, carbon tech, as we call it, so that utilization outside of enhanced oil recovery, I think could be a really important policy lever for this. Yeah, just to uh, add on to this point as well, too, I think, um, you know, a lot of times when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions removal, uh, we talk about it in this way of like, yeah, let's get the CO2 out and like, um, you know, uh, address just the emissions. I think also, too, there's room to think more about like, what future do we want to create? What is the vision for this, you know, high end, um, clean uh, environment, you know, decades, hundreds of years from now, uh, what does that actually look like? And, you know, with utilization, you not only are creating kind of present jobs, you, you know, you have to, to actually utilize the molecule, molecule, you do need technicians, you need uh, scientists, you need support staff, you need um, a whole ecosystem and, and uh, economic supply chain to utilize the CO2 and get it into the market and that creates jobs right now. Uh, but then you also are creating this future that I think all of us really want. I mean, I think, I think when we think of like, planet earth a hundred years from now um you know in this what i think is i have like a somewhat optimistic view that all of this work we're doing now will pay off and we will have this amazing planet in which we all live and we still are going to want these uh these products that jennifer mentioned that um that, you know lanza tech and 12 are looking to make where we're going to want the the high performing shoes and the and the clothes and the jet fuels to carry 200 passenger um uh you know uh planes of, of people um, across oceans. Uh, but we, we also gonna want a clean economy and, and making those products out of CO2 just makes so much sense in terms of creating circularity, creating the economic value uh, and creating that future that we, I think we all envision inherently. That's great, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna shift now. Um, I've got a couple of questions for all of you but I love that you're just jumping in, it's awesome. Um, you know, Madeline teased up a, a number of topics and we've talked in, pol in policy before the Congress right now. And we've talked you know, a bit about thresholds and increased credit levels. I wanted to switch because it is so timely right now and, and talk a little bit about budget reconciliation and kind of what we're seeing. So um, for those of you who aren't closely following it, we saw in um, language coming from House Ways and Means, their reconciliation text, um, it play, their text has language that would place facility-wide capture requirements on industrial and power facilities. So it would require a percentage capture at the entire facility level. We're hearing from project developers um, within the coalition, that's really unworkable for them. And, and there's also the 
the feeling that this is really, uh, or almost would be a, a rewrite of 45Q and the congressional intent behind the Future Act. But I wanted to hear from all of you, you know, what do you think if this language were to be enacted, what would the effect of kind of placing a facility-wide capture requirement on the deployment of utilization projects? You know, we, as you just mentioned, we focus so much on, on storage, but kind of what effect would those, um, those requirements have on the development of utilization projects? Yeah, I can just speak from sure. kind of our experience at, at 12. I mean, I think, um, when we we're doing customer discovery and talking with um, you know potential customers, and a lot of times some of the, especially these larger facilities um, have multiple uh, and different uh, concentration uh, streams of CO two, and so there's um, there's this you know lower hanging fruit um, kind of CO two stream that's highly concentrated and uh, industrial source and tends to be smaller as well, and um, oftentimes when our conversations are happening, you know. And again, because there is kind of this uh, desire for um, both parties to kind of mitigate risk as you go along and meet milestones and show the technology works, and also that um, you know there's also an economic piece to it as well. Often our discussions are like, well, let's let's look at converting this concentrated stream of CO2, and then later on we can work with your more dilute streams, uh, which just inherently because you have to do the separation and separate the CO2 oftentimes and make these end products you do have to, uh, there's an extra cost associated with that. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, like, and I, I get the in, the intent, I think there's, you know, I think, uh, you know, my understanding of policy, you wanna like limit kind of bad actors and 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 um, and have uh, the intent of the law and the spirit of the law move forward. Um, but this, this does add a little bit more friction to uh, certain scenarios. And there are some cases where, um, you know, maybe it changes the risk profile, it changes the economics, uh, because this smaller stream of CO2 would have been converted and utilized, but because the economics are different, because of the, you know, it's not facility-wide just yet, then that that could maybe a address the project. And I think ultimately it's not what the um, policy wants to do, but I think that could be a, a consequence, an unintended consequence of, of having these, um, you know, facility thresholds. Thanks. Does anybody else want to jump in on that one? Well, I'm not going to jump in until Erin, the great Erin, speaks because she knows what she's talking about. And I'll, I'll just add a comment after that. So you go ahead, Erin. I don't know that I have anything that amazing to say. I think that I think the thing that um, I think a lot about, I think maybe because I've spent most of my career working on 45Q, I think a lot about unintended consequences of policy design. And I think for this, what, uh, you know, I, I think to Atasha's point, in a lot of ways, it makes sense. Like you can, you can say, I understand why policymakers want to incentivize higher capture percentages, right? Are the whole point of doing carbon capture on a point source is to meet climate goals, to, to get rid of emissions. So get rid of more emissions. But I do think it is really important to think about the full policy landscape and to think about what it's like from a project developer standpoint and what are those challenges and I think to address them holistically. And so for me, when I'm thinking about, you know, what tools do we have to incentivize higher rates of capture versus something that, you know, you're gonna have smaller streams or more modular applications. So, you know, do you want to to not incentivize sort of modular deployment of, of point source carbon capture, things like that. I think it can be something where, um, you know, it, you have to, if you don't look at that full landscape as a project, you know, the way a project developer does, that you're going to end up sort of not meeting those goals that, that you want, even if you, again, I think on paper, a lot of us agree that the more carbon you capture, the better, right? That's where uh, I'll hear to talk about that today. So I think to me, it's sort of like, um, if you need to think about that more holistically, if that's your goal and what the actual kind of use policy to address those specific needs, not just do it piecemeal, because then you're going to, to Atasha's point, have some unintended consequences. And, and the only thing I would add to that um, is we really need to be really careful, okay? Um, I started my remarks by saying we cannot put any more carbon in the atmosphere. We're already seeing the consequences. I don't even want to have a discussion about 2050, right? I mean, how many more people have to lose everything? 
before we realize that every single carbon that ends up up there is a bad thing. And so what I worry about legislation that that starts to reduce the options that because that's essentially all it's doing. It's reducing the options. It's making the box smaller. This is a nascent industry right now. We need to throw everything at the wall and then see what can scale. And what can scale then the market will decide, right? After we get past this initial phase. So the box needs to be as big as possible so that we have technologies and approaches that can, that can help five to 10 years from now and really have an impact. So let's not constrain it. Let's make the box big. Thank you. I love that. Let's let's keep the tent big. Let's keep the box big. Um, I think that's a great transition to my next question. And then I think after this next question, if there are audience questions, we can start taking some. So um, again, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand um, in the Zoom or you can type it in the chat and I will read it out. Um, so in terms of, you know, thinking about climate and reducing emissions and, and you know, addressing air pollution, can can you all talk a little bit about, you know, do you see these technologies playing a role in addressing um, decarbonization and air pollution and how your organizations are, are thinking about that issue? I can. Sure, I go can ahead, Jennifer. That, my favorite topic. <laughs> you know, one of the nice things about not burning carbon is you reduce particulate emissions and NOx as well, right? And that's a very important consequence of capturing carbon and reusing it. The other thing I think is really important is if we start talking about sustainable aviation fuel, the fuel that we're making has no aromatics, right? And even though it's a drop in replacement, what that basically means is that it burns cleaner. NRC, National Resources Canada, has done quite a bit of work on the combustion properties of our sustainable aviation fuel and see significant reduction in particulates and contrails. These things are huge. They have huge impact. And then we can start talking about social justice, right? Who lives near the airport who sees these contrails in the sky all the time, right? And so I really believe that we need to start talking about the additional benefits because at the end of the day, we also need to start regenerating our system and our environment and not just reducing our emissions. So handling, you know, doing reduced water use, reduced particulates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is what we have to strive for, not just a reduction in greenhouse gases. How do you follow that? Like, yeah, I feel we use the emoji reacts in our in our internal Zoom meetings a lot. And I'm like tempted to uh, start doing that. Um, yeah, I think we are. You know, we talk a lot about the climate need for this, but I think we, at least at Carbon 180, when we talk about that, and I think for the full field, if we don't talk about it in terms of not just CO2 emissions, but, you know, as Jennifer put it, like, who is impacted by this? Are we talking about everything from local air pollution to, uh, you know, who gets the jobs from, from the, you know, we talk about the economic opportunity, but we know that that economic opportunity is not distributed equally at all. And so we have this opportunity as we're thinking about, you know, to Tasha's point, we think about 2050, 2100 and the world that we want to live in and that we want, uh, you know, to, we want to see, uh, uh, you know, that we want to build right now, that we have this opportunity to use carbon removal, to use carbon utilization, not as a way just to address climate change and not in ways that sort of uh, perpetuate uh, environmental injustice as we've seen sort of many of our energy technologies and systems do over the past hundred plus years, but instead to redress them, to be actively improving local air quality, to be you know, thinking about who owns these projects, who gets the jobs, are these union jobs, who gets the benefits for those. So all of those pieces. And I think, um, you know, I, I think it's just this enormous opportunity that not only should we do this for all of the very obvious moral reasons, but I think it's this, this opportunity to come in and say, we're going to create a different kind of world. We're going to, you know, in the same way we're thinking about re, you know, we're, we're talking about rethinking a carbon molecule and seeing it not just as this issue of waste, but as this opportunity to create new economies, we can think about what those economies should look like and and who benefits from them. And so I think that's just such an amazing and exciting opportunity. And I think we have to think, you know, back to the conversations about 
unintended or intended consequences of policies and stuff if we do not incorporate and center those environmental justice questions, those concerns about, you know, every, you know, all of the things that we're talking about that we're, um, we're not doing our jobs. Yeah, I mean, I think um, both Jennifer and Aaron really summarized it quite well. I mean, I think internally with our company, we realized that a, a lot of our plants will be add-ons to existing industrial plants, which are already in, you know, uh, disadvantaged communities. And so, you know, we were starting to think like, how, yeah, how do we make sure we hire locally and we bring in uh, members and, and provide these, you know, um, more uh, manufacturing and technical jobs that can be um, deployed in these in these areas. Um, and, and also thinking of, you know, just uh, of course the reduction in, in greenhouse gases and how do we um, you know, do even more cleanup than um, than just that point source emission site. And I think that's where direct air capture comes in. We we are ultimately agnostic to the CO two source. We we just do the transformation and focus on that. And and being able to uh, couple with a direct air capture technology and company, there's several out there. And um, there, you know, we can take the CO two that was put into the air, you know, in the past, and and and. That, you know, that technology will strip it out and then we can convert it and make um, something useful out of now and kind of almost like clean up past CO2 emissions in addition to the present ones that we would um, address with point source emissions. Um, so we, we really see ourselves holistically as part of an ecosystem of uh, CO2 utilization and, and capture and, and um, this whole new, um, yeah, this whole new ecosystem that we're building with carbon to value, um, and and definitely also see you know public private partnerships coming along, and 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 the policy being a, a big piece of that ecosystem as well as we we grow the company. Thank you. Um, I have more questions, but I'd like to hear from the audience. If there are questions from the audience, uh, please raise your hand and I can directly call on you and you can unmute yourself or you um, can um, also type it in the chat box. We did have a clarifying question come in. Um, could you please clarify um, what you mean by thresholds? So happy to do that. I'm actually gonna pull up my handy chart here. <laughs> I always refer to. So the 45 Q statute um, has eligibility requirements um, in the form of annual cap carbon capture thresholds that are for different facilities. So um, for carbon utilization projects, the threshold it has to meet a minimum threshold of 25,000 um, metric tons of CO2 or uh, it's precursor carbon monoxide um, per year. And then it has a maximum threshold of 500,000 metric tons of CO2 or carbon oxide. And there's also thresholds um, for carbon capture at industrial and um, power facilities. So I hope that clarifies that point. Um, and, you know, if, if if our director were on the call, he could he could ruminate about the legislative history around thresholds. I wasn't really around for that, so I can't, I can't speak to. It. I don't know if any of the panelists want to talk about because it, it is an interesting question of why these thresholds um, even exist in the first place. Um, I think you know we could talk about how there the question of we did you know policymakers didn't want um, you know, we're worried about unintended consequences. Um, but are there other questions? If not, I'll, I'll go to a few more that I have. Okay, seeing no hands. Um, Atosha, I wanted to build on something that you had just raised in terms of direct air capture. You know, if you look at the, develop, the, the business developments in this space, you see a lot of discussion of direct air capture and carbon utilization together. And so I was wondering if um, you or any of the other panelists could explore some, what are the synergies between the two technologies and why, why are we hearing um, about them together so often? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one way to uh, look at it is that um, if we want to create artificial trees, like in industrial trees that would um, take the CO2 and uh, out of the air and really uh, utilize it and um, mimic trees in that way, then direct air capture is kind of like the leaf part of the tree where it, it sucks in the CO2 and 
um, then our technology would be um, kind of in the trunk or the internal part of the, the tree actually doing the conversion to, to a, a more reduced molecule. Um, and I, I think there's, um, you know, in, in a lot of the re reporting that's done on, on climate change as a whole and like how much um, greenhouse gas emissions we have to um, eliminate, there's also, um, you know, you know, modeling around um, not only just eliminating the current emissions we have, but also uh, removing some of the past emissions that are already in the air and like really bringing that number down. And so direct air capture is one way of, of um, you know, accelerating that uh, reduction of CO2 in, in the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, I think there's um, also questions around, you know, um, there's these secondary markets for carbon credits and uh, carbon accounting and direct air capture gives you a very specific and, and scientific and um, accurate way of counting the CO2 that's, that you're directly taking out of the air. Whereas I think um, other methods of kind of carbon accounting, I think there's, you know, there's, there's still some room for development in terms of like how to, how to kind of measure truly um, net carbon that you've removed and or, or prevented from going to the atmosphere versus carbon that would have been removed anyway through maybe natural organic processes or um, or just, you know, um, yeah, just like, um, you know, CO2 that just just happens to be removed maybe wouldn't, wouldn't have even gone into the atmosphere. So I think there, there's like um, a, a drive and an interest in, in having that technological solution because you can count the CO2 very well. Yeah, and I'll add, I think there's so many interesting, like, I think the word might have been synergies, but, you know, everything from, you know, you have a lot of flexibility in where you might site a director capture facility. Um, and so you can think about applications on aircraft carriers to, you know, new locations where you want to build new industries. You can think about different scales, you know, we're talking about thresholds and the challenges around um, really massive thresholds for utilization in the near term, and you can scale direct air capture to the right size, or you can think about, um, we have a project that's going to be coming out in the next few months that's thinking about everything, you know, there was a, uh, the DOE's Office of Science put out uh, a FOA, I think, on uh, direct air capture that included things like integration into HVAC systems, and you can think about building scale direct air capture and utilization in ways that you know, make it really tangible for, for people who don't spend all of their time talking about utilization of carbon removal like we do. Um, and, you know, to Tasha's point, I think there's this really awesome opportunity that we touched on earlier, which is to provide this market for the captured CO2. And so things like direct air capture, where it's not a point, it's not point source capture, you're not um, generating uh, you know, you're capturing CO2, you're doing climate good, you're not necessarily unless you're, you know, without selling that to a market to a company that's going to create something out of that captured CO2, you know, you don't really have a market right now for it. And so it can help deploy um, and help, help us deploy more, more director capture work quickly. I think the other thing is, especially in the long term, you know, one of the things that Jennifer touched on was moving away from, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in the process of moving away from fossil fuel use. And so for us, when we're talking about direct air capture and utilization, you're actually not touching the kind of fossil fuel world at all, right? You're, um, you know, you can think about how utilization is entirely decoupled from this. And, and I think subsequently, you know, lots of implications from that, but one is also just a much longer runway where we can think about utilization as something that we're gonna be using for decades and, and something we're gonna be using after we stop using fossil fuels. Absolutely, and I, I would just add one minor comment. So for us, I don't care where the CO2 comes from, direct air captured or out of a flu stack or whatever. What I do care though, and I believe that one of the most important technologies that will come in in our time in the next 20 years is direct air capture. At the end of the day, we've already dumped way too much carbon into the atmosphere. And I don't know about you, but I know we can't stop tomorrow. Okay, well, there's too much of our economy that depends on it, so it's not going to happen. And so the only way that we're going to get this planet back into something sane and livable and enjoyable, which is what I care about, <laughs> is if we, in fact, start taking carbon out of the air. Trees can do it, but they just can't be enough trees to take us back down to where we need to be. So I would encourage everybody that's listening to support director capture 
in any and every way possible. We need to make that technology succeed. Great, thank you all. Um, we got another question that came in in the chat. Um, you know, we're talking about scaling up and, and how to kind of, you start sort of small scale and then just grow as big as you can in terms of volumes of CO2 utilized. Um, the question is to put scaling issues into perspective, what are the near-term volume limits of CO2 that Lands Attack and 12 are, are looking at? We're designing a plant right now that should capture around 300,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, the one that's operating is more on the order of 50 to 100,000 tons of CO2. Um, so, but we're scaling to go beyond that. Yeah, and uh, we're a little bit behind uh, Lanza Tech uh, by about 100x right now. We're, we have um, pilots that are uh, 300 tons um, per uh, year of CO2 conversion is what we're uh, working toward. Um, but I would say, you know, beyond us, where our scale is at now, I think the question is really how fast can we scale by 100x and 1,000x, 10,000x? Um, and there, I, I'm really optimistic um, in our ability to scale because we we basically are drop-in replacement to um, to uh, uh, water electrolyzers. So we we cut out the electrode and put our electrode in, and so um, we basically just have to scale one component to meet the size of um, current water electrolyzers, which are are scaling themselves. They are they are you know megawatt scale, uh, you know tens of thousands of tons, hundreds of thousands of tons. Um, of you know, equivalent um, water electrolyzer systems being planned for and, and eventually deployed in both US and, and, and Europe. And so we can basically ride on those coattails and, and scale very quickly. So we, you know, we see a world in which you know, we can 10X our volume within uh, several years instead of uh, you know, a couple of decades as, as um, some chemical plants and things of the past and chemical technologies of the past have, have uh, had that scaling factor. We think we can be a, a lot faster. Than that. Great, thank you. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna do an impromptu lightning round here. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about, we, we have a lot of work ahead of us in terms of meeting this challenge and, and the role that carbon utilization can play. Um, I'd like you all to future cast. So in 10 years, um, what do you think the world is going to look like with regards to utilization and um, kind of what's your vision? And if you could just give it in like a sentence or two, that would be great. Yeah. I. I would like to see several, what I'm gonna call artificial forests or industrial forests that are um, hubs for uh, capturing the CO2 and converting it and utilizing it to something. Um, and, and also having smaller uh, groves, uh, industrial or artificial groves that are coupling with direct air capture systems and, and doing the same thing. Cool. Well, I, look, I, I'm not going to opine. Science is already opined, right? I mean, we're supposed to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by the end of the decade, right? So that's what we need to do. And we're going to do this because of carbon capture and sequestration, carbon capture and reuse. Those are the two enabling things that are going to make all of that happen. And I don't have a question about that. That has to happen. And of course, foundationally, it will be enabled by, by renewable power. Give me renewable power and I'll turn every CO2 into something you guys can use. Um, I think uh, we see carbon utilization, carbon tech products at the millions of tons a year level um, that we see you know, everything from those commercial products you interact with to the behind the, you know, the building materials and your new buildings and fuels and your plane um, being replaced with, with zero carbon and low carbon alternatives. And I think that will be, uh, you know, I think one of the most important levers in getting there is federal policy. And in particular, I think uh, the federal government has uh, a really big opportunity to use direct procurement, um, both of, of carbon removal and carbon tech products as I don't know, one of the most important, I think, most direct ways to get us there. 
Thank you all so much. This has been a really tremendous um, conversation. I We're at the hour, but I'm just going to quickly turn it over to Madeline, who's just going to close out today's event. Yeah, thanks so much, Jesse. And huge thank you to our co-hosts, Lands Attack and Carbon 180, um, all of our panelists and speakers, and to those of you who tuned into today's briefing. Um, you know, I think from the discussion, it's very clear that we are at a tipping point that has the potential to shape the strength of our energy and climate policy for decades to come. Um, and, you know, it's clear that carbon utilization, carbon management solutions have a, have a really significant role to play. Um, so if you have any follow-up questions in the coming days, um, please feel free to reach out to any member of the Carbon Capture Coalition, um, and we will be sure to get those answers for you. But uh, thank you again for tuning in and have a, have a nice evening.